they were just girls out to have a bit of fun. They really were just into the fun of it all. They wanted to be pop stars. The plan for Mel and I, way back when we were kids, were that we were going to sing together. With Mel and Kim, you took nothing serious. They giggled all the way through. If you listen to the Mel and Kim records, there's laughter all over the place because you couldn't never keep Mel from giggling. Brought up on the mean streets of Hackney, sisters Mel and Kim Appleby were always going to make it. We were real street, streetwise, we really were. We were very sus. Two East Londoners were very, very sus. Mel had been a, you know, a topless model. Kim made knickers down the old Kent Road. Page three stun and Mel had taken her first steps into showbiz with the exclusive Glamour Girls Roadshow. I got the idea of putting together a group of lesser known models that maybe had appeared on page three into an, an actual show, uh, which is how I met Mel. She was very comfortable with herself and with her body. I don't think she had any qualms about doing um, glamour modelling. She was enjoying it. I mean, it's better than working in the rag trade, for God's sake. <laughs> we were in the studio recording Mel one day, and um, the engineer was joking and said to her, is there any more like you at home? She went, yeah, I've got a sister. And I said, well, can she sing? She said, yeah, she can sing. Having recorded a demo for Al, the sisters were quickly snapped up by Pop Supremo's Stock, Aitken and Waterman. These two girls came up to me and said, here, you looking for any pop stars? Can you make us pop stars? I can! They were two lovely kids, you know, young and wild and uncontrollable, uh, and so excited about being in the studio. Just the way they were was what forced us, in a way, to make the records we did with them. The guys, Stark Aiken and Walkman, wrote the songs around Mel and I because we told stories from where we were coming from, from who we were. The Hit Factory's newest recruits were an immediate sensation, but unlike many a paranoid pop star before and since, they made no attempts to hide Mel's page three past. Respectable was written because you know, we really just didn't give a shit about these pictures coming out. So they decided to write a song called Take or Leave Us, Only Please Believe Us, We Ain't Never Gonna Be Respectable. And it was perfect because it was so us and really, really enjoyed singing that song. We had a great time singing that song. To me, Wayne Mel and Kim dressed and the way they came over, it was that whole kind of shop, Saturday afternoon shop culture. The whole thing was that you can be, you know, you don't have to have the money to be hip and trendy and do whatever you want to do. You know, you just, you got to go for it. Mel and Kim kind of reflected buoyancy that the 80s had, there was optimism, there was certainly, um, you know, there was an economy that was doing quite well. You can imagine those two girls being at every club you went to on a Friday night, there was a hundred of them sitting there, all looking the same, all with the same attitude. Turned to the guys, we went, FLM. And they went, yeah, and we went, well, what is it? And they go, fun, love, and money. But FLM really means fucking lovely, mate. That's what he meant, because everyone would just walk around the studio going, fucking love you, mate, fucking FLM, FLM. So <laughs> they'd written this song called FLM, and we obviously thought that it stood for fucking lovely, mate, but they changed it and turned it into fun, love, and money, which we thought was really good, it was really clever. Another hit. But something was wrong. The sisters canceled tour dates and didn't appear in their new video. In the press, rumours spread about Mel's health. By this time, Mel was having back problems, complaining of back problems, which we thought at the time was due to the dancing, because we were doing so much dancing, and the schedule was a joke as well. We were promoting. I mean, there was just no time to stop. So she kind of soldiered on regardless until, until it got to a point where um, she couldn't perform. She'd collapsed in, in, a, in a clubbing. 
um, Tokyo dancing. She just, the pain had been too much. She collapsed, they'd rushed her off to hospital. It became really hard work keeping it a secret and hiding her from people, you know, because obviously she was bloated from steroids, she'd had chemotherapy, so she'd lost her hair. So when the news did break, it was a big relief and we were, actually went on Wogan just to put the record straight, to be honest with you, because there were so many stories out there and we went on Wogan, which was great for her. Oh, yes, I'm living now, I've had enough. I'm tired of you going strutting all yourself. And I know that you Mel and Kim were like my daughters. I mean, we had a, a very special and different relationship. Because I heard it all before, because, baby... <laughs> I was in Japan and I got a telex that she died of pneumonia, you know. It's the saddest thing that's uh, ever happened to us in our professional lives, that we discovered Mel was seriously ill. Um, you know, looking back now, their career had only really just got started. They were the first girls on top. You know, they were the first girls to say, you know, chaps, up yours. I say we were one of the original girl powers, to be honest with you, but we had balls. But it was real. It was raw. And, you know, it was fun. <laughs>